Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first installment of Charting with Charlie Bellello uh, webinar for, for 2022. Uh, after some great feedback, after several installments last year, I'm excited to kick things back off with you, Charlie, and, and welcome you. And thank you, you know, as usual, for joining us and, and sharing your insights with, with us and uh, you know, everybody that's, that's joining us this afternoon. Yeah, awesome. Good to be with you guys. If this is anybody's first time uh, on our, our monthly webinar here with Charlie, um, if you're not familiar with Charlie, uh, as I always say, you should be, uh, you know, follow him on Twitter, follow his blog, uh, Compound. It's uh, the, the insights are always, always great. The visuals are, are amazing. They go along with those insights. Uh, a quick note on the visuals, all of the visuals that we use today in the webinar will be available uh, in Y charts under our templates in our fundamental chart. So if you have any uh, conversations that we discussed today that you think would be good to take another step and, and share with some of your clients or anybody that you may be talking to, uh, feel free to use those. And I know Charlie's always been extremely generous also in offering the resources on his website, Compound, and on your blog, Charlie, and saying if, if anybody wants to grab the visuals from there, I think you're okay with that too. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we've got a lot to cover today. Anybody that was hoping 2022 is going to be a Nice, calm, uh, you know, year in the markets. That, that's definitely not the case. So sorry for any disappointment there so far. Uh, it does give us plenty to talk about, though, Charlie. And I'll, I'll just run through the agenda quickly here, and then we can, we can jump right in. But we're going to spend some time talking about the free money effect. Uh, inflation, which has been on everybody's mind. The beginning of the end of easy money. Uh, easy money certainly been around for a while. So excited to hear what you have to say about that. The other side of mania. The high growth crash, which I think uh, everybody's extremely interested in, in hearing your take on that right now, since that's been top of all the headlines. And then uh, a little bit of a take on the change in the American psyche and why 2022 is a different market environment than what we've seen over the last, uh, last year or two. So let's jump right in. If anybody has questions as we go, feel free to enter them in the Q&A tool within the, the webinar, and we'll maybe answer some of those as we go, but we'll probably save most of them for some Q&A at the end. And if you do have to drop or if you get disconnected, don't worry, we'll send a recording of this webinar out to everybody that registered uh, probably later today or tomorrow. Let's jump in. So the free money effect, uh, no new uh, information, anybody, Charlie, that government's been borrowing and spending money. So talk us through these charts and then we'll, we'll go through a few that I think that layer on top of this, but take it away. Yeah, so I, this really sets the stage for you know for everything else that that we're about to see in terms of you know driving uh, the economy, markets, uh, speculation, inflation. Everything begins and ends with this chart. So we decided during the early stages of the, of the pandemic uh, we were going to do something you know pretty much that we hadn't done before, which is uh, throw everything at it <laughs> that we could. Uh, and then some. So you know, we borrowed. Now it's, you know we're bumping up around six trillion, higher than than pre-pandemic levels. Uh, that's a that's a pretty significant increase. Uh, the Fed uh, in turn bought a lot of that that paper, uh, and we've seen a forty percent increase in the money supply, over forty percent now in the last two years, which is by far the highest we've seen uh, in U.S. history. So uh, the the thinking uh, along the lines in, in the early stages were uh, this is only good. Like there's, as we're going to see in the following charts, uh, you don't see bad effects immediately. You only see good effects. And uh, the what we saw is really the impact in every every facet of the economy, markets, uh, and speculation, and spending, et cetera, et cetera. So let's run through some charts to see, you know kind of what happened. Uh, so yeah, first we got, you know, consumer spending. So if you give the uh, American consumer free money, they're going to do a few things with it. They're going to uh, save a little, they're going to spend a little, uh, and they're going to speculate a little bit with it. And so by the third round uh, of stimulus, that which was uh, March of last year, you just had this enormous increase in savings uh, from that we haven't really seen before. Uh, in history. Uh, so that translated directly into higher retail sales, as we can see here, 22% increase from before the pandemic to April 2021. 
in that short period of time. That increase was more than the prior five years combined. So just a tremendous boost in terms of consumer spending. Um, that wasn't the only thing, of course. If we go to the next chart, we have that spending helping corporate uh, America. So we saw a V-shaped recovery in both sales and earning S and P 500 earnings, which hit hit record highs every quarter last year. And uh, and in terms of profit margins, uh, they hit record highs as well. So they were able to corporations were able to pass through the price increases and then some. So we have earnings boom. We have the retail sales boom, and the next boom, of course, is the economy and Again, initially everything looks good. Uh, you don't you don't see uh, any bad effects until later with a lag. Uh, you just have a V-shaped recovery in GDP. Again, this is nominal prices, so it's you know people rarely think in terms of of inflation adjusted prices. This is what they see, and they see just a huge increase in economic output. Um, we saw uh, employment come screaming back, and the unemployment rate is now below four percent. It's pretty much back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so that's an incredible move lower. Uh, and we actually have now a labor shortage, uh, you know, which is a big difference uh, than what we had uh, initially there. So, you know, big change, you know, all facets of the economy being lifted by this huge uh, increase in consumer spending and, and government spending. So all these charts so far, Charlie, none of, none of these... Uh phenomena seem to surprise you based on what had been happening with that first chart. When you think about the data that's coming out now that is on a lag, like GDP, how do you process this data? How are you thinking about this compared to more leading indicator data? And just talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, the early stages of the boom are going to be the most extreme in terms of, of the impact on the economy, because you know, people will feel the most comfortable, they'll start spending a portion of that, and inevitably they'll get to a point unless another round of stimulus comes uh, where that'll dry up. So the rate of change will, will kind of slow. So that's what we saw in the fourth quarter there. If you looked at consumer spending and retail sales, we started to see a little bit of a slowdown, but it's it's a just a lower rate yet. So we have, we're not yet seeing a wholesale rate of change. We just couldn't keep up with if we're looking at things like ISM manufacturing or some of those indices which tend to be leading or, or uh, you know, any of the other leading indicators, we're just seeing a, a slower rate of growth than we saw, you know, let's say March, April, May last year when you had that just huge flush of money and, and people ready to spend it again. Um, so, you know, we're at the point now we're kind of assessing uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. How much, how much more is the consumer willing to spend here? Are they starting to get nervous about higher prices? Are they, uh, you know, are we reaching the point where we're kind of shifting? And you know, we're not there yet. Like we're we're slower than we were in the early stages of last year, but it's nothing so far that's that we can see even with leading indicators that would be alarming, saying like a recession is imminent. So let's jump into another boom, but maybe one that less people saw coming. Yeah, the, you know, well, this is this was really an incredible, and it was it wasn't it wasn't shocking to see we we got you know a hint of it in 2020 uh, in terms of the flood of the IPOs in the back half of that year, uh, but just in the first few months of 2021, it was nothing like nothing we'd ever seen before uh, in terms of SPACs. You were seeing. A billion dollars a day in issuance for for a good few months there uh, it's just in, in, incredible and it dwarfs pretty much anything we've seen so you have a, a combination of just uh you know venture capital money private equity money uh, you know companies looking to cash in right and and in terms of the SPAC side it was just easier to raise money than ever before and people were taking advantage of that and uh, and we've seen the opposite side of that, and, and we'll talk about that later. What's been the results of that? But you know, just if there's this excess flood of money, it's going to go somewhere. And speculation is a big part of any type of inflationary regime. If you go back in history, and you look at different periods of high inflation, you see uh, speculation in the early stages almost every single time. Uh, so this was this was not nothing unusual. It's just the I think the 
how quickly it came and how concentrated it was and how uh, the investor euphoria surrounding that pretty much a year ago, we're close to the peak now with that. We hadn't seen that since, since in the U S since 2000. And, and so uh, that was just a huge sentiment thing. The thinking was, you know, I could buy pretty much any of these SPACs or new issue IPOs, and I'm just going to mint money. Right. And that, that type of sentiment is what you need to, <laughs> for companies to uh, go public and, and, and for these SPACs to raise all that money. Right. Um, so it, it, you know, it's a consequence of the free money, but it just, I think it just, everything just accelerated much quicker than, than, than people probably could have imagined. Sure. And I know we'll talk about the performance of, of these, these baskets of securities, these IPOs and these SPACs, but is this a trend that you expect to slow down just as far as the number of issuances and companies that are going public? Yeah, no question. It's already it's already started slowing. If we look at, uh, I think, look the other day, the first few weeks of this year, we've seen about five billion in SPACs. At the same point last year, we were at close to thirty billion. Uh, so, you know, big difference. It's a, it's already becoming more difficult. Investors are more skeptical. Markets, the, you know, the high growth crash is obviously pushing some private companies to wait, right. And hold off in terms sure. of going public and, and the SPAC market is just totally different now. Uh, so yeah, it's, you know, we'll see how it ends up you know, at the end of the year, but you know, first few weeks or any indication it's going to be a, a big drop off. All right. Well, well, speaking of the markets, you know, I think the, the next boom here, just the markets in general, right? Yeah. So, and this is again, no, nothing unusual with uh, inflationary regimes. You see multiple expansions and speculation and, you know, this, this had already been trending up prior to COVID, but this kind of, uh, you know, got the additional, additional boost it needed in terms of sentiment. And this is just looking at S and P CAPE ratio, which smooths earnings over 10 years. And, and, you know, at the end of last year, we we're at the highest levels uh, since 2000. So, you know, we can look at a million different metrics. They all show something similar. If you look at price to sales, we're above 2000. Um, you know, if you look at, we break it down into to, to different, uh, you know, deciles, they're, they're, they're all looking very similar uh, uh, to the 2000 regime. It's really the only uh, comparable period. So um, certainly the, you know, the amount of money looking to get away from you know the threat of higher inflation uh, and just the idea of you know interest rates are zero and and therefore I can spe freely speculate in stocks that was two big driving forces uh, for this multiple expansion one of the things that we look at a lot internally and when we're talking to our clients whenever we're looking at PE ratios or in this case a, a cape you know, it's it's a impact of two things. It's either well, it's really just prices increasing faster than earnings. But in the environment that we've been in, earnings have also been growing pretty fast. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, using that ten-year average to smooth out earnings, we also have a, a big blip there from uh, that first quarter of, of 2020. But what are you thinking about going into earnings season? Or I guess we're kind of in the middle of earnings season right now. But how are you thinking about the results and uh, applying that to the overall market valuation right now for where things might be headed. Yeah, I think you know why why it's helpful to kind of smooth earnings over you know ten years. It doesn't have to be ten years. That's just the number sure. <laughs> Schiller picked. But uh, over some period is is because earnings can be pretty volatile in, in short term periods. And if you're just using one years of, of earnings, you you know that that might lead you in the wrong direction, particularly at extremes, right? So you know almost by definition, at the peak of a cycle. You're going to have the highest earnings and then therefore stocks are going to look cheaper right and at the bottom of a cycle if we looked at 2009 earnings had collapsed right stocks look very expensive because of that um so trying to normalize that is just trying to trying to get away from that one year's worth of earnings which might make stocks look cheaper than they otherwise are so like you know if we're looking at s p just on Last year's earnings, you know, you're looking at multiple around 24 at the end of last year, which is doesn't sound super high. I think the average since since 1990 has been, you know, about 19. So, you know, not not super high, maybe 20 percent above that. Right. Would get you back to that. The question is, is you know, 
have have earnings and and particularly margins which really expanded you know if the rate of earnings growth slows down or we have some, some type of pullback um, you know how will investors react to that so you know very quickly you could see that multiple compress and that's that's kind of what we've seen in the in, in the first few weeks of this year so but looking at earnings so far this quarter not, I don't see any any huge red flags it's you know they, they look pretty good so far looking at, you know, banks and, you know, the market's reaction has been more telling, right? If you look at a company yeah. like Netflix, if it would have reported that same number years ago, it wouldn't have gotten slammed. And then it just gets slammed because, you know, it's, it's a different environment, right? It's now all of a sudden 20% growth is not enough, right? To support that multiple. Whereas a year ago, uh, you know that type of growth rate people were per, were happy to buy into so uh, it all depends on the environment but so far i don't expect fourth quarter earnings to show any any huge red flags and so we'll see how the first few quarters of this year you know, play out but uh, i think you know that's that's impossible to predict that's why you're just looking at looking at where you are in terms of of, of the multiple and it's only really hugely relevant when you're at an extreme like we're at today right so you know, and I've, we've talked about it and I've written a lot about it. Well, what do you do about being at such a high valuation extreme? Well, there's, there's a few options, right? For investors, they can, they can diversify away from that extreme, right? Looking at international markets, they can tilt towards value, uh, you know, areas of the market that haven't really experienced this boom, uh, or they can just be more conservative, right? In general thinking, you know, not trying to time the market, but saying, maybe the risk reward isn't as compelling here. So I'm going to hold a higher percentage in, in safer assets, right? So uh, any number of those things you can do uh, to try to, to mitigate the risk of another uh, contraction like we saw following a 2000 peak. Sure. I will, I guess we'll hold some of that information for uh, the, the later conversation too, but let's, let's move yeah. on to the, uh, I think the second to last boom here, the, the housing market. Yeah, this is this is a very important one, right? Uh, psychologically, for people, their house for most in people is their biggest uh, investment, uh, their largest uh, piece of equity. It's higher than what people hold them in stocks on average. So, psychologically, this is this is very important, and it's also important because it's the biggest uh, component of consumer spending. So, about a third of people's uh, monthly income and budget they spend on housing whether it's on mortgage and, uh, or it's rent uh, so it's a it's a huge huge factor and just what we saw last year uh, the case shiller index on average nationally rose 19 percent which is something even during the housing bubble we had never seen a, a one-year increase that big so um, again the 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 free money effect part of that right people have higher higher cash, they can spend more on down payments. Uh, the Fed at the same time is buying mortgage bonds, right? Mortgage rates has hit an all-time low a year ago, 2.65%, right? So you can afford more in terms of the monthly payment. So all of these factors combined uh, just led to just an uh, unrelenting boom in the housing market. Uh, and you know, we're starting to see signs of a slowdown in terms of, of that growth just in the last few months. But uh, just, just an incredible, incredible uh, a jump higher. And if your assets aren't in your home, they're probably in your crypto wallet, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so this is, again, not, nothing, uh, nothing unexpected, but in terms of, of the rate of increase, I, I think that would probably surprise a bunch of people. So if you look at where crypto bottom there in around March, of 2020, along with the equity markets, right? Uh, we're you know you're looking at Bitcoin over over 10x since then, and Ethereum you know 50x, right? So and then you know there's a, any number of coins that are 100x or more, right? From there, and and so you know again, speculative activity increases. Uh, people are looking for an alternative uh, to fiat currency, given the increase in the money supply. And crypto it was the right time and place for for crypto to have have its boom, and and nobody knows what the price for Bitcoin or Ethereum should be or will be. Um, but I think the story around them really uh, was solidified given 
given that first chart saying like perhaps there should be an alternative to, to fiat currency uh, where there's a limit in terms of the supply, right? That story just, uh, it became compelling, right? Now, do we overshoot perhaps, right? Crypto Bitcoin is down 50% from that high uh, last November. So it wasn't immune uh, to, you know, the idea that perhaps a tightening in Fed policy and the slowdown in the money supply is going to reverse some of those gains. But uh, I think the notion that, um, Bitcoin is going to go to zero or these things won't be around in some form or fashion is kind of uh, been thrown out, uh, at least for the time being. Yeah. And I guess kind of moving into the next topic, you know, talking about inflation, uh, a quick plug. One of the things that we did looking at crypto prices and you mentioned that, uh, you know, restraint on, on supply for, for money. We did a little study internally, which was published by our marketing team uh, a week or two ago, looking at adding several different things to your portfolio in, in a small allocation as a way to hedge against inflation. And one of the things that we studied there was crypto. I won't give away the, the results. Yeah. Um, obviously, certainly added some volatility to your portfolio, but uh, there were some interesting findings in that study if anyone wants to take a look at that. But let's jump into um, you know, that bigger topic, inflation and, and what's happening there. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty simple story, I guess, when you start, right? Yeah, it's it's and again, it's with a lag, right? So you see that that spike there, you know, it didn't start really until early early last year. We came into 2021 at around one percent inflation, and everyone said, "Okay, that's great. We can do more. Let's let's do two more rounds of stimulus." And uh, and then just lo and behold, a few months later, we start to see that lag defect, um, and and so we have. You know CPI at seven percent, highest since eighty two. If we take out food and and energy, are the highest since nineteen ninety one. And I think the important point here is that it's been widespread. It's not just one area of of consumer spending. You're seeing it uh, across the board, right? Uh, you know, so energy prices, right? Gas, fuel, fuel oil, your utility bill, electricity. Uh, food, right? Whether you're buying at the grocery store or eating at a restaurant, uh, you know, the proteins, right? If you're looking at meat and, and, and fish, chicken, right? That's, that's gone up more. Uh, and just the car market, right? Uh, has been really the, the prime example. And I think this is a, this is one that really shocked a lot of people, including myself, that at least the rate of change didn't <laughs> slow down and kind of accelerated again at the end of the year. So you have, who would have get, thought that used car prices in, in uh, 2021 would be higher than, uh, they'd increase more than the S&P. I mean, so used car and truck prices were up 40, close to 40% last year versus, uh, you know, 28% increase for the S&P 500. So, um, you know, this is the, they're talking about uh, things that are not sustainable. That, that to me doesn't make much sense, but, um, but it's economics, right? There's just, they can't make new cars, uh, because of the shortage in chips. They can't make enough of them. There's so much demand. People have more money, same, same factors that are driving other retail sales. And there's just not, not enough supply out there. Right. And so, you know, I think that that will have to change. I think with, uh, you know, the pandemic moving from a pandemic to endemic and countries learning to live with it. Um, you're going to see, uh, you know, production ramp up to try to meet that demand. It has to, right? That's just simple economics. If there's a profit to be made <laughs> on selling these new cars, like people will, are willing to pay a premium to get them. Uh, so they're going to ramp up production as soon as they can. So it'll be interesting to watch this, but this is kind of a barometer in my mind for, you know, the non-transitory nature of some of this stuff that just, it just continued to persist. It didn't abate uh, in terms of 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 the imbalance, and yeah. so yeah. I, this is an interesting one because you look at this, and it's one of those things where it's an asset that everybody has, but you can't sell it because you can't replace it, and you need it. So <laughs> I, I always see this data as as kind of a, a you know a, a carrot hanging out in front of you that you can't really grab. But yeah, no quite Like, how, what are you going to do? I mean, if, unless you move to, I guess if you if you were moving to a city where you didn't need a car uh, and okay, that, that would be the one example. Sure. But and then you go else, back, 
a few slides looking at the housing market. Everybody's moving out of the cities, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you, you mentioned trans story, and I know we talked about that a lot last year as, as kind of the, the Fed's take on what was happening with inflation. Um, yeah. As we get into this section, uh, I, I know we kind of timed this webinar up nicely with you know, the Fed announcement that came out uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, Charlie. I think you were keeping an eye on that. So maybe yep. you want to cover that quickly and then we'll jump into the section. Yeah, really no surprise. I, I didn't expect there to be from, you know, I just quickly looked at the at the statement there, it seemed pretty much what people were, uh, were expecting. They're prepared to hike 25 basis points in, in March. Uh, they're prepared to end QE in March. And then, you know, from there, it's, it's, I think it'll be a dance, right? The market's expectation is that they're going to hike four times this year. Um, I think that's, that'll be dependent on what happens in markets, right? In the economy, whether they can get to that. And then, and then perhaps they could, you know, there's a chance they could go faster, you know, than that as well, which people aren't thinking. But I think for now, nothing for today's meeting. We'll see what Powell ends up saying, but uh, it doesn't seem to be anything different than what market participants were expecting. They've been, and they've been telegraphing this now for, you know, since early December when they when they changed their tune, uh, getting rid of the transitory language. They just don't want to look bad at this point, right? It's becoming month after month where inflation is going higher they can't keep saying dismissing it right when that's their that's one of their mandates right is to control uh try to control prices and uh, having the easiest easiest monetary policy in history uh when prices are at the highest levels in in 40 years doesn't make it didn't make much sense last year but it certainly doesn't make uh, uh sense today so uh so what we're what we're seeing now is just the beginning of the end of easy money. Why is it the beginning of the end? Because we have a long way to go before uh, money is not easy, right? If you're starting from a, a real Fed funds rate of negative 7%, um, if you consider 0% uh, to be uh, a neutral policy, so like today that would mean a 7% Fed funds rate. You know, and that's, you know, that's not going to happen. But let's say inflation comes back down to 2%, let's say best case scenario comes back down over the next two years, back to 2% where it was, where it was for 20 years before, um, before this period, um, that would mean you need still need a 2% fed funds rate to be considered neutral. So it's the beginning of the end because they're starting to move and, and we don't know how much they'll move or how close they'll get to a neutral policy, but uh, this is this is the start, and and this chart just can't it can't persist, right? Because uh, if if they just continue to do nothing in the face of it, uh, you know that's that's going to create more problems, and and the last thing they want is to be blamed for you know for an inflationary spiral that they did nothing about, right? So I think that you have you have an interesting uh, situation here where they're they're planning on taking it easy. They don't <laughs> I, like a 25 basis point increase given what we've seen in the past year is really, right, really nothing. Let's be honest. That's like, uh, and a lot of people, the counter to that is people like, well, why hike rates at all? It's not going to, you know, it's not going to help the supply chain and, and they'll, they'll make a lot of arguments like that. And, you know, why they need to do it is they can impact the demand side, right? They can impact that side of it. And, uh, and and try to rectify the imbalance, right? So they don't need to be stimulating the housing market, stimulating borrowing and, and spending at this point, right? And kind of balance that risk, right? So uh, so we'll see what happens. It'll be interesting year with the Fed, but uh, but for sure, uh, money can't get easier than it is today, right? And we're we're moving away from that. And this this chart is just the most to me the most compelling chart you can find in terms of why the Fed is behind the curve. They just ignored higher home prices pretty much every month over the past uh, year, uh, and they continue to buy mortgage bonds in the face of that. So that can't continue. That policy doesn't, to me, doesn't make any sense. And, um, you know, I think the home prices, at least, you know, in the near term, I think you could see a slow down at the very least, and maybe even a contraction. If we start moving in the opposite direction, I think uh, interest rates on mortgage 
30 year mortgages are, are up, you know, almost a hundred basis points from where they were uh, last year at, at this time when they hit all time low. So that's something it's not nothing. Right. Uh, so we're back to for mortgage rates, we're back to pre pandemic levels, but prices are still, you know, much higher. Right. So, yeah. you know, you have to kind of throw out now that, oh, that argument where, oh, well, it's much more affordable because people can get a lower rate mortgage. Well, now mortgage rates are back, but home prices in many areas are up 20, 30, 40, 50%. Right. So what is it? It's inflation. It's speculation beyond just, you know, a, a fundamental argument where people can buy more. Um, so, you know, that, that's a difference in the market and that's an important one, I think. And, you know, kind of building on that, that topic we just talked about, right? Rate hikes are, hikes are coming. We know it, you know, the, the Fed's saying it. Um, yeah. We're, we're seeing it across the curve too, right? So what, 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 uh, what are you thinking about the, the bond market right now and how it's being affected by the, the pending hikes and rates? Yeah, and and you just you see it in, in all durations, right? So there's this there's you know a, a notion that that Bernanke tried to put out there years ago, where he, he said we don't control interest rates, right? The market controls interest rates, and of course, you know to a certain extent that's true. Uh, certainly on the long end, that's more true. But in terms of short term interest rates, the Fed has nearly complete control, and you can clearly see that here, right? Uh, when they cut rates, they go down and, you know, looking at one year and, and when the market knows that they're going to hike rates, they go up, right? So, uh, you know, the market's just moving towards that for rate hike possibility. I think that's what's what's kind of priced into the these interest rates here. And, and you know, if, if they sense the Fed is going to be more aggressive, you can see a more aggressive uh, move in some of these, but, uh, you know, They'll, they'll, they'll trend in the direction of that expectation, right, over that time period. So if we end the year at, at one year, at, at four rate hikes and the market thinks that's the Fed's done, then we should see one year treasury rates, you know, somewhere around that, right? Um, if the market thinks that, uh, you know, we're going to see another four hikes in the next year, then you'll just see a continued shift higher. The longer end is harder to predict. But you know, just looking at the reaction today, uh, you know, stocks are pretty much where they were, you know, when, when the announcement came across and bonds are getting hit, you know, particularly on the long end. So we're seeing, you know, kind of the reaction, you know, that you would think, which is, okay, we're tightening monetary policy. There still has to be a, an adjustment here. Tenure at 1.75% with, uh, with inflation at 7% is still it's still pretty low, right? So I think there's certainly room uh, for, for that to move higher. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's just the market moving first. That's that's what the, that's what should, this, this should tell you. And uh, it's a normalization. And in many respects, it's a good thing. Um, you want to see a normalization. You, you don't you didn't want to see rates stay where they were in March, April 2020, because it means that uh, we're headed for depression. And that's what people were thinking back then. So the fact that, They've recovered, uh, you know, is a good thing, and they haven't recovered nearly as much, obviously, as the economy has recovered in other segments of, of of the markets. And that's such a such an important message, I think, especially with a lot of people, you know, that we've talked to, and a lot of people attending the webinar. You know, whether you're speaking to clients that you've invested dollars for, or thinking about your own portfolio, you see this rise in rates, and, and immediately everybody gets nervous about that, but. You know, when you put that into context with where things are historically and the fact that we are moving back towards a, a healthy place and, and it's actually potentially something that could be putting you at ease as far as uh, expectations for the future. Yeah, it's just it's just a it's a free market, more of a free market, I should say. It's not certainly not not free, but you're you're letting the market dictate more so, you know, how how capital should be allocated you know whether to to borrow whether to make an investment rather than this artificial type of demand right we have artificial inflationary boom which is not real and you find that out later and you have an artificial um, you know speculative boom uh, based on low interest rates you know that's not real as well and as soon as you take that away then you see the other side and 
So that's a good segue into, into the next segment. Yeah. Speaking of booms, I know this is a topic we've been revisiting for the last uh, several months as we've gone through these webinars, but give us the update on the meme stocks. Yeah. It hasn't been, hasn't been a good, uh, (laughs) a good period for the meme stocks following, uh, you know, really the peak for most of them uh, in late January, early February last year. And we've just seen declines 60, 70, 80, 90%. Uh, from all of these. So almost every example, uh, with the exception of, of the two, two biggest GameStop and, and AMC have, have not only given back all of their gains, but have gone down in excess of, of that. And so the lesson is the same, uh, and no one wants to hear it at the time, but just two words, don't chase, right? Don't, don't fall prey to that herd behavior. You're unlikely to time it well. Um, and even GameStop and AMC, even though they're not back to the pre-mania levels, they're, they're still down 80% from, from their highs. Um, so there's, there's, there's anything that's gone up as much as, as they have, of course, can go down equally as hard, right? And then some. Um, so, but, you know, what's, why did it change, right? It, I, I don't think it's over. I think there'll be more crazy moves and speculative moves and stops, but uh, maybe we won't see what we saw in January, 2021 for, for some time. Right. Cause that it coincided with all of that, uh, all of the other stuff going on, right. You had the stimulus coming in, you had just uh, you know, it was, it was the perfect time for mania to take place. You had all of the new issuance and in, in, in SPACs, you had um, you know, growth stocks, doing well you had everything pretty much booming at the same time so i'm not sure we'll see that again i mean given enough time perhaps we will but um it, what we saw with with with, the, with these stocks is 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 predictable but we just didn't know when it was going to bust right it's just in the end the weighing machine comes for everything and the weighing machine is just what's what's the fundamental value right and if it's just not there uh, you could bid these things up for uh, for a period of time to levels that nobody could predict, um, but eventually, given enough time, the other side of every mania is that weighing machine saying, "Okay, what is it worth?" Right, and do the fundamentals justify it? Right, that could yeah. take years. It could take days. You know, we we've seen it all different varieties. Right, in the past few years, we've seen you know crypto coins like uh, just go crazy you know, very quickly and then come crashing down dogecoin you know obviously uh was uh, was the perfect example and you know peaked the day musk goes on saturday Night live joking about it and of course he he drove a lot of the run-up just having fun you know tweeting memes and things and and but the other side is you know what's there right uh, when when that fades what's there there has to be some underpinning right beyond that and it's uh it's fun and games very you know for that time period but you know now you know anybody who who bought into that is having a tough time like you know how do you evaluate whether to to hold this thing and what (laughs) are you waiting for the next meme to come it's just impossible right yeah yeah you mentioned fundamentals a couple times i know that's a word that uh, you know, as it got thrown around forums a, a year or so back, you know, people would kind of laugh it off, like the fundamentals don't matter, but maybe they're coming back into play. Yeah, they, they, right. It's, 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 they, they always matter, but it's the time frame, right. That matters. And you know, we had a webinar where we talked about Alibaba, right. And, uh, and Baidu and, and, and many different stocks of that nature where they're trading at these huge price to sales multiples. And then, you know, it seems like valuation doesn't matter. And then you fast forward and then very quickly it does matter. And then by the time it does matter, it's too late to do anything about it. So you have, you have to say it matters before and then say something's off here. Um, the market is usually right, but it's not right in this instance. Right. So SPACs, I think would be fit into that example, right. Where you just had so much supply Hitting the SPAC market, uh, it would have been hard to to for it not to be overwhelmed, right? So, um, just the speculative act- activity in the first few months of last year were, were incredible, and 
investors, it seemed like a good bet, right? Let's chase it. These things are going up without even a deal announcement. You don't know what they're buying. There's a celebrity or an athlete attached to it, right? You remember that where it was every yeah. day, a different person was coming out with the SPAC. Those are all red flags, warning signs, but you didn't know when it was going to break. It could have kept going for a little bit longer, but again, it has to be, they have to buy something that's, that's a good buy at the end of the day, these like uh, the purchase. So you can't just, uh, you, you, you can't justify it on the idea alone, right? It has to be, uh, there has to be a fundamental reason behind it. And so just this divergence, I think is telling, right? Like they you know, just bought this boring S and P it would have made 30% last year and chasing SPACs, depending on your timing, you know, you're obviously you were down, you could have been down much more, right. If you bought near the peak. Uh, yeah. I think SPACs also benefited from having a, a fun name to say SPAC, <laughs> you know, it was easy to, gather some momentum people were talking about it if they were called special purpose acquisition companies i'm not sure if it would have the same not as fun momentum. yeah that, that's true yeah for years nobody even heard about it. no one cared about it. i mean SPACs have been around a long time they, yeah and it's just it you know it was the perfect moment um where there used to be a lot of energy companies and and, and things like that like boring company you know, not boring but just not tech related and then sure. you know that when that changed it became oh okay this is you know but at the end of the day it was a it was more of a vehicle for sponsors to you know accumulate assets and and you know affect the deal structure and try to uh, you know try to i'm not saying they weren't trying to to do well with it but it became it became a, a game of of raising money versus a game of you know the game of investing which is a lot different well, let's jump into our next topic. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in too. So if we, if you've asked some questions, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on them. We're going to try to get to them at the end here. But um, it's been been all over the news, the high growth crash. Uh, yeah. Give us give us your take on on what's happened in the last uh, couple of weeks here. Yeah. So yeah, we'll just start with this illustration here, right? <laughs> you know, kind of law of gravity. What goes up in extreme amounts must come down. Uh, so just looking at stocks that doubled or more in 2020, many of these names will be familiar. If you look through them, you got Zoom, you got Peloton, you got Zillow, you got Roku, uh, any number of other ones, Pen, Pen Gaming, uh, Chewy. People love these stocks, right? They had a great story. Some of them were pandemic plays, so to speak, and, and they were going to benefit from people staying home more. Um, almost all of them had above average growth rates. Uh, and the thought was that that was going to continue. Um, and then an interesting thing happened in around February for most of these companies last year, they just, they started to falter. And while the broad market ignored it, the S and P kept, and the, and the NASDAQ 100 kept pushing higher, you know, this high growth segment was anticipating a change, right? Um, so just as that, those easy money policies and the thought that maybe we'd have zero interest rates forever, you know, kind of benefited these companies with with no earnings or, or little earnings, right? And just the idea is, you know, well, what if the if the discount rate is zero? Well, I what I can pay fifty times sales, a hundred times sales, and it doesn't matter, right? Um, but as as we're as we're approaching the normalization, you just see a complete repricing and a round trip in, in most of these names. Um, so it's an incredible lesson for investors um, that just be wary of of the story um, when when you're paying such a high price. Yeah, it's hard as we talked about. It's hard for companies to grow into those expectations, um, and we just seen that so many times. Uh, but this, this was the first time probably since 2000 that we've seen just so many, uh, names, the segments of a market trading at these high multiples together. And and when I first saw this table, um, you know, the, the first thing I did is I look at these numbers and you see these much bigger percentages in the green column than you do in the red, but then, you know, it, it just takes a second to, to grasp how the math works. If something goes up, 200% and only needs to go down, you know, 66% to be back to where you bought it. So those mm -hmm. numbers obviously outweigh 
Um, I, I took uh, a few minutes in Y charts. I did a, a little bit of extra analysis on this just because it did pique my interest. If you take, I think there are 48 stocks here. If you take the 48 stocks here and you look at their full return from either the beginning of 2020 or when they started trading until uh, I think my data went up to yesterday, almost exactly mm-hmm. half of them over that time period have outpaced the S&P 500 and the other half has underpaced. Uh, I took it a step further and I made a equal weighted portfolio of all of these stocks from the beginning of 2020 and compared that to the S&P 500. And right now, the S&P 500, I think, is to overperform that equal weighted portfolio just barely. But it's, it's just so close to coming back to that mean. I know we've talked about that trend in several slides and you know, you've talked about it here, but things, things re- react back to the mean. Really, all you got by investing in all of these was, was a lot of volatility, a lot of drawdown, and, and probably a, a lot of uh, very excited you know, feelings throughout the ride. But it, it's just interesting, or at least it was interesting for me to see how even taking a basket of stocks this volatile over the longer term tracked the market almost perfectly. Yeah, it's hard to beat. It's hard to beat the market, and when you're talking about such a differential, we'll talk about it in a few slides between these high growth stocks and, and the market. Um, that can't persist, and the question is, you know, how quickly does it kind of come back to normal? Um, but first, let's just talk, touch on Peloton. And again, there's a few, few of these examples, but I think this is probably one that's familiar with a lot of people on the call. But you know, it's almost 6x uh, increase from the start of 2020 to the beginning of 2021. I mean, that's just <laughs> just an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable return. And at the peak, you know, Peloton's trading at 20 times sales. They can't keep up with production. They, you know, everything seemingly looks good. They just, you know, they're just, they're just hitting it, hitting on all cylinders, right? And then just any little crack signs of weakness i think the first first thing was they had some issues with their treadmill right and then you know there was just rumblings of okay we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown but nothing to worry about to the point where you know i think last week they announced they're not making any any bikes they should or treadmills for the time being because they have enough to meet current demand so just we've come full circle in, in terms of of the sentiment of the stock from you know from extreme greed to, you know, I don't know if it's extreme fear, but it's, it's approaching that today. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't fancy myself in any way, a, a technician when it comes to charting, but uh, looks like a little bit of a head and shoulders pattern there at a, at a glance, which I don't think is, is a positive one. Yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, this is uh, the interesting thing with a lot of these names. Peloton's not unique in this respect, but um, it's back to where it was in, in early 2020, but, you know, by all accounts, fundamentals are, are, have improved, right? At least where they look today, right? The revenues might come down in the, in the coming quarters, but, um, this is, it's an interesting thing. Their revenues more than tripled, right? And the stock is back to where it was. So like, what was the problem? The problem was price, right? That you paid. So it went from, let's say, five times sales in, in early 2020, which I guess is not egregious for a company growing at the rate it was growing, but it got all the way to 20 times sales um, by the end of that year. And, and now you're looking at two times sales. Uh, so just, it's, this, is, this is not unique to Peloton. It's just investor, the price investors are willing to pay is very fickle, right? And when you're paying a very high multiple, as we've talked about with with Snowflake or Rivian or a number of the examples last year, like everything has to go right for you to to for that investment to be to be a good investment for you, right? And there's no margin of of safety. Um, but here we are today. Now it's an interesting bet, right? I, I don't I don't know. Like, is that a, is two time sales appropriate? Maybe. Right. I'd, <laughs> I'd certainly feel better about it today than a year ago. But I think sure. most people, right, the ironic thing is, is the opposite, right? Most people liked it more a year ago uh, than today. But um, at least now you can make a case. Okay. Maybe there'll be a rebound. They'll figure out. We still have that app. 
which is essentially a software product, right? Where you don't even have to buy the bike and they're charging people, I don't know, $50 a month. And, and, you know, that should be profitable. They get, if they can grow that business and like, so it's, it's not worth nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The question is, merchandise you know, out there too. <laughs> yeah, right. Did they overshoot, right? And is it worth something to someone else, right? At some point, is it worth something to Nike or somebody that that, yeah. that wants it? At a certain point, it will be, right? Uh, so, um, but I think you know, on the way down, the lesson on the way down in terms of the multiple compression is like you don't know where that's going to stop. Like, you know, like, Oh, Oh, it was at 20 times. Now it's at 10 times. Well, then it got cut in half again. And then it got cut in half again <laughs> after that. Right. And now just now the really bad news is coming out. Right. So the market was anticipating that. So, um, so, but on, I think on the, this next chart really tells the, the broader story here in terms of the high growth bucket and arc is, you know, everyone's familiar with arc and, I wrote about it last February in terms of a, a FOMO and sentiment indicator. Uh, you know, just had billions of dollars piling in every week into this uh, vehicle, uh, you know, based on performance, right? That just had a tremendous re returns in 2020. Um, and the expectation was that, okay, they're going to continue to do well, right? And, you know, we've seen many of these examples in the fund industry throughout throughout history right and almost every single one of them comes back to some type of mean reversion right you don't know when it's going to happen this ha happened to happen pretty quickly but just a point here on, the, <laughs> on how extreme the differential was you're talking about arc you know tripling from beginning of 2020 to its peak in in 2021 and uh you know s&p's up you know 30 30 percent 35 percent over that period of time so that's that spread it's such a huge differential. Now you got to ask yourself, well, why the spread, right? Why did it occur? And what I was writing about and talking about at the time is it's most of it is multiple expansion. It's not that the companies within that portfolio had their fundamentals had increased, had tripled, right? In that one year time period, right? It's that their price to sales ratios had tripled. So I think like the average median stock in ARC, I just ran the numbers before this webinar was around, around 10 times sales in early 2020, which is high, but not, I guess, crazy high. I don't know, crazy, but a year later, they went up to over 30 times sales, right? And that's extreme. Like that's extreme for a single stock, but to have a portfolio of those stocks, well, now every one of them, right, on average has to meet those expectations, right? So that was exceedingly high. And the fascinating thing is many of them grew, uh, like we showed with Peloton and, and, and if, we, if we showed Zoom or you know, Teladoc, any number of these companies, they grew through uh, revenues throughout their period. Uh, so what's interesting is today, after the com crash down for ARC is down over 50%, uh, the price of sales median price of sales of the portfolio today is around eight times, right? So it's actually below where it was when it started, uh, you know, this run up in, in, in 2020, uh, which is, which is pretty, which pretty is it now is eight times the floor. No, who could say that, right? It could go to four times or maybe it goes to S and P trades at around three times sales. So, you know, probably should be some premium given the growth in that portfolio, but, uh, it just, it just shows you that, that extreme, how, how important the, in the short-term uh, psychology and sentiment of investors is, right? It drives almost everything in the short run. It's not fundamental changes. Fundamentals don't change as quick as, as prices, right? And this, when prices really go crazy in a period of time, it's almost all a shift, always a, a shift in sentiment, right? And so just be careful when that happens to just do a reality check, right? Is this, you know, does this make sense? Right. And, and, and clearly 30 times sales is just a high hurdle. It's not impossible, right? There have been some companies that have been able to grow into that, but um, very, very tough to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it goes back to what you were saying about the, the fundamentals, right? Like you can be right. The revenues can grow, but you have to weigh how right you are with where the fundamentals are when you get in and what those, projections would, would have to be where that would have to get. So 
Yeah, you just and you have to anticipate, which is impossible. You have to predict what investors are going to pay for that level of sales in the future, right? And that's where you get into trouble because you assume that okay, after this period, strong period of fundamental growth, they're going to continue to pay as high of a multiple, um, but they don't because that period is over and now there's a new regime, right? Uh, yeah. Well, it goes back to that quote from, I think, I don't remember who you, who you quoted, you know, several months back, but saying that, uh, you know, multiples are, uh, or, or a, a PE ratio or valuation multiples are just, a you know, current expectations now times what, what might happen in the future. I think if I'm quoting yeah, that price yeah. today or so, multiplied by a story tomorrow, I think about yeah. tomorrow. Right. <laughs> And that story That's about tomorrow <laughs> changes <laughs> dramatically, right? As we saw with Peloton. All right. Well, let's cover. I think we got two more quick topics before we get into some of these questions. Yeah. So let's jump into this uh, change in the American psyche. Yeah. So this, this is an important one. And this happened much quicker than I anticipated. I, 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 you know, I thought that it would have taken more time, I guess. And, and the way inflation played out, I guess it didn't, but so this is a poll in, in January of 2021. So the second stimulus had just passed and there's a poll asking people, you know, do, do you think another, a, a third round is necessary? Right. And as you can see, Republicans, Democrats, you know, by and large, let's do it. Right. And this was after, at this point at the rec- economy had largely recovered, right. The, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the evidence that you needed a third round and, the, and to, it to be the biggest round ever wasn't very high. But the thinking, if, if you talk to people and, and, and you ask them why, they, the thinking was, well, there's very little downside. We just don't see it. as we, All they saw was positives, right? They saw the stock market going up. They saw housing prices going up. They saw people spending money, right? Uh, the economy coming back. Why not do more? Right. And, you know, so that was the thinking. Right. And for a little while, it, you know, it, it, it that, you know, that stayed, uh, you know, we got an infrastructure bill passed. Right. And, you know, that was more of a bipartisan effort, but still people weren't very concerned uh, about the size of it. I think they cut it down a little bit. But um, but by the time we got to you know, later in the year, just every month higher in inflation, people started to change the way they thought about you know, additional stimulus and then thought about additional borrowing from the future to spend money today, which is essentially, you know, what those bills did. Right. And, and this is why I believe they, they had a change of heart is they saw that their earnings all of a sudden weren't keeping uh, pace with rising prices. Right. And this is when uh, inflation really starts to hit, hit home and you start to question, right. Is free money really free? Is you know, is it going to be a problem? And uh, and this is a problem, right? If you don't want this to persist, because you know this is people's standard of living going down, and we've seen obviously the extreme examples are you know just high inflationary, you know hyperinflationary regimes. We don't have that here yet, uh, not even close to it. But we've seen that in, in Germany, we've seen that uh, in Argentina, Venezuela, any number of countries. You don't you don't want that spiral to persist and, and people, people, there's two things you can do about it. You could say, you know, we, we just need to do more to get, to get out of it, right? <laughs> just keep spending more and that'll, don't worry about it. Or you start to be concerned about it. And I, I think it's interesting that people had a change of heart. If you looked at consumer sentiment polls, uh, you listen to Joe Manchin uh, in terms of, you know, he's a Democrat and he just said, he just, he couldn't go to his constituents and say, we're, we're going to need to do another two trillion here, given the reality right on the ground. He just could not sell that to to the people of his home state, right? And I think that that was a representation of of probably uh, the people as a whole. I'm sure there, there's a certain segment that wants more, but like at least questioning it. And I think that's a that's an interesting change in the psyche, and 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 we'll see how long it lasts, and maybe there'll be you know, a compromise and there'll be some bill passed, but I think the, the notion that, that you can just, you know, just keep doing it without there being consequences, I think is, is starting to fade. And, and this is the reason why. So what's that set up for the market environment for this year? 
yeah, it's, it's like, we know what's gone on in the past few weeks. So no question that's already different, right? Last year you had that free money effect, right? That's starting to wear off just by the nature of it, right? People have spent a portion, right? They, maybe they speculated and lost a portion, right? With some of those manias, uh, they invested some, which has done okay for sure. But uh, you don't have that same you know, huge boost, right? It's still there. It's they haven't spent all of it, so I don't. It's not. It's not nothing, um, but it's just the rate of change will be lower, right? Um, the the Fed obviously very different environment. We're looking at rate hikes. That's not to say that the market can't be up when the Fed hikes rates. Oftentimes it is, um, you know, at least initially. Um, so that doesn't preclude that, but that's far different than, uh, you know, doing QE every month and, and keeping rates at zero. So that's, that, that's obviously a change. And, you know, in terms of volatility last year was very, very smooth year. You only had a, a 5% max drawdown. That's far below what you'd see in the typical year this year. We already hit 12% earlier this week in terms of a drawdown. And I think that's consistent, seeing more volatility wouldn't be unexpected, you know, not just this year, but going forward, right? Uh, just you tend to see more volatility at higher valuations. And we've seen that with the growth stocks. And why is that? Because at the first hint of something not meeting those expectations, people will sell first and ask questions later, right? So uh, that just creates more volatility by its nature, right? Uh, because they have one foot out the door, uh, so to speak. Uh, and in terms of earnings, last year was such a huge year, 60% earnings growth in the S&P. We've never seen that before. Uh, just, just a huge year you know, benefiting from that stimulus. Margins you know, expanding to record highs. This year is going to be tougher, right? As we're seeing with the early reports, again, they're, they're not bad, but now you're comparing to a year ago uh, when they weren't bad either, right? So you're going to see, you're not going to see Obviously, sixty percent. You know, you're not even twenty percent. Right? You no, know, you might see something closer to the historical average, or even above that. But just it's just more realistic, right? And then in terms of margins, I expect to see some compression there. I mean, wages are going up. We look at the banks; they started talking about, you know, compensation pressures, right? Hitting, you know, hitting earnings, right? And they're not alone. It's it's happening across industries, right? Prices are going up. And they were able to pass that on for a period of time, but there'll, there'll be a point where it's, it, you know, it hits, starts to hit margin, right? Uh, I'm guessing. And just the attitude about inflation. We talked about the change in the psyche. We started out, don't worry about it, right? And that was from the Fed. That came from the Fed. That came from Janet Yellen, right? Uh, and the Treasury. That came from everywhere. Don't worry about it. And now it's okay. Maybe don't. You know, we're, maybe we're not going to go into a recession, but it's a risk, right? It's a risk, at least that growth is going to slow and, and inflation, you know, may be a problem, right? Uh, in terms of the housing market, which again is an important psychological thing, you just, you can't, you can't see another 20% in your growth there. It's just, uh, you know, that, that would push you, you know, certainly past the bubble stages that we saw the last time around and, and, you know, so I expect to see a slowdown in the rate of growth, if not, you know, just a, a moderation, maybe even even dips in certain areas. You just you had such a such a tremendous run up. And, and, you know, some of that will be dependent on the mortgage market. Some of that will be dependent on supply, uh, you know, but like just you know, seeing a normalization in that market, um, because if you just look at home prices to incomes, they're stretched again, you know, and and you know, that's, that's really not a good thing and that's not sustainable. Um, and then in terms of manias, uh, we're going to see our fair share every year has them. There'll be something this year. Uh, that's a mania, but, um, you know, more, more, you're going to see the other side of it, right. As we're seeing, you know, in all of those areas from the last few years, slowly, but surely one by one, whether it's Kodak or, you know, you can name any, any speculative Avis, right? Like any, these, you know, compressed spikes, like in terms of just people speculating without any care in the world. Uh, you know, I think you see less of that and, and you see more of, of, a, of a move to reality when you have 
just a normal, a move, at least a move more toward, towards a more normal interest rate market and normal uh, market in general. That's dictated, uh, you know, not by uh, not by excessive stimulus and, and manipulation, right? So, um, so that's it's, that's a different year. That doesn't mean the S and P can't be up. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, you know find places in the market to invest, um, but the you know the sentiment and and it's it's just a change right it's a, it's a move towards a a, a reality that's going to be a, a more difficult time for investors and and eventually that'll bring opportunity right because you do want to see you know if you're a long term investor you want to see uh, and you want to see declines to to the point where you have a better risk reward for asset classes like that's a that's a good thing that's if you're investing for the next 20 years, right? Uh, you know, so you should view that as, as a positive, not a negative. Yeah, I think that ties back to a, a quote you had on your blog, uh, maybe a day or two ago, right? About the difference between speculating and investing. Yeah, yep, sure. Like how you feel uh, yeah, about uh, when, you, when you, there's a correction in the market, right? If you're a speculator and you see a decline in the market, you're, you know, you're nervous. Uh, and rightfully so, because you have such a short time frame that um, you know you're not going to you're not going to wait around to to see things come back, right? But if you're an investor, you should be excited by the decline, and the bigger the decline, the more excited you should be, because that means the prospective returns are are going to be higher, right? Um, and so, you know this. You know, this is just another correction so far, right? We've had a long list of corrections since 2009. And a webinar a few months ago, we talked about the buy the dip mentality. And uh, every single one of these, you know, within a year and oftentimes shorter than that, uh, you know, the SP would come back to hit new highs. So this is the buy the dip generation. And one of these inevitably will end up being a longer lasting bear market. But um, I think until until you get to that point, people are going to assume that that it's it's still a buy the dip environment. But we wanted to ask that question in a poll now. What do you think about the current correction that started um, just a few weeks ago, which it hit twelve percent, you know, early this week? What do you think ultimately will be uh, the the decline from the January fourth high? Do you think it's going to be uh, the low is in, uh, which would be 12.4 percent so we're, you know we're ready we already hit the low we're going to go back and hit new highs uh do you think it's going to be somewhere between uh you know 12 and, and 20 or do you think it's going to be a, a a bear market of 20 percent or more so interested interested to see uh, yeah, we'll, the results we'll leave that there. up yeah we'll leave that poll up for the next couple minutes um so do you want to talk through this slide a little bit or should we jump right into a couple of questions that come up yeah, no, you know the slide just is a, is a representation of 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 that. There's always a reason, right, for the decline, and the reason always changed. I think, you know, people are using the Fed tightening and, and rising rates, but it, if it wasn't that, it could have been something else, right? We've seen that number of times, but we've seen many other different things, from debt crises to worries about the economy, right, and recession and uh, obviously pandemic, right. And all the different variants, every variant is a reason for a sell-off. Um, but you know, the reasons change, they don't, they don't really matter so much. Uh, uh, but this is, a, this is the price of admission for equity investing, right? You don't get the upside e equities have done 10% a year, the last hundred years, bonds have done 5% cash has done 3%. This is over a hundred years. You don't get that premium from investing at stocks for nothing. You get it because primarily there's a risk premium and that risk premium is a result of higher risk. And that comes in the form of painful, painful declines and correction. There's no other way, right? So um, that is the price you pay for those higher returns. And last year, there wasn't much of it. Not great. You know, there'll be some years like that, but more often, you're going to have, you know, periods of excruciating uh, declines in between. So, yeah, let's go. Let's see the results and go to the Q&A. Yeah, I'm going to. Oh, there we go. We have some poll results in. Can you see those, Charlie? 
Yeah. So we got 13%. Think the low is in. Okay. Not many. Interesting. That, does that mean the market's having a sell off here? Well, I'll take a look. I think, I think we're slightly down today. But. Okay. So a little reversal. Maybe, maybe Powell did not, uh, said the wrong thing. Said. <laughs> He's a little bit too hawkish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, only 20 and 20% say bear market. So more say there's, there's more pain to come. I think that's the majority. Uh, but very few think the low is in. So I guess in the next month webinar, we'll see, uh, we'll see if one of these plays out and we can say who is correct. But, uh, but yeah, Charlie, do you buy into the, uh, as goes January, so goes the year. No, not at all. I've, I've tested that as, you know, it's a myth like many other, many other things. Uh, so goes January. So goes nothing is, is <laughs> I say. So I could, I could point to many, many difficult Januaries, you know, that's not, uh, that's not, that's not important. <laughs> All right. Use something else if, uh, for if you're going to sell, not uh, <laughs> not seasonality. Yeah, and sell in May is another one, which doesn't. Yeah, the data doesn't. Those, doesn't those are always out. fun to. Fun, yeah. They're so easy to disprove. They're always fun to draw some draw some charts around. Yeah, yeah. Um. All right. So a couple questions came in uh, just about the dollar and and the strength of the dollar and how that's going to be impacted by inflation and rising rates. So talk talk, talk about the dollar for a minute, Charlie. Yeah, the currencies are a tricky one. They're 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 all relative, right? And if, the dollar, I guess, as compared to what is always the question, right? Uh, you know, the two biggest components of the dollar, are, you know, the euro and the yen, in terms of the dollar index, if that's what we're talking sure. about, by the yeah, dollar. Yeah, the DXY is the. Yeah, and and so they they dominate that, and like if we look at policies in the US versus those country in terms of central bank policies, right? They're pretty similar. Everyone's in maximum easy mode. The dollar strengthening versus versus them, you know, perhaps because you know we're gonna hike rates first, right? And and be a little bit more aggressive there. Um, but you know, I think I guess more interesting for for people is how does the dollar do relative to you know, your purchasing power, right. And the inflation, right. Picture. And are, are you losing, you know, dollar relative, you know, you and I, a dollar relative to the Euro uh, doesn't matter so much unless it's just collapsing. Right. Um, but it does matter that the dollars in the bank that you have, like we'll be able to buy uh, you know, a, a basket of goods. <laughs> uh, that same dollar won't depreciate very quickly. Right. Which is kind of, what we saw last year and we don't want to continue. Right. And I guess also the, the dollar relative to cryptocurrency would be an interesting thing as well. Right. Like, is it, if, you know, if, if the increase in the supply of crypto, like something like Bitcoin, I think it's one to 2% a year. If you compare that to the increase in the supply of dollars, right. Um, you know, it's, it starts to be an interesting analysis and certainly that's, that's been the case for crypto, right? At least, at least Bitcoin, right? That there's just a slower rate of increase and there's a cap on it, right? Um, so, but in terms of investing, you know, I, I think trying to predict directions of currencies relative to one another is, is a difficult game to play. You want to diversify probably your currency exposure. I don't think, you know, so by owning international equities, you're owning currencies outside the US if you don't hedge them, right? And, you know, Maybe that'll work for you. Maybe that won't, but you know that gives you some protection. Let's say if the, the dollar would, were to collapse relative to them. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm getting I'm getting pressure here from my my team chat over here that, that says we need to wrap this up. But I I want to go okay. through at least one more question here. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to the beginning of the webinar when you were looking at you know that very first slide. You said this slide really tells the whole story, and the bottom chart on that slide was M2 money supply. Um. As the Fed starts to taper their purchasing or stop their purchasing and raise rates, how long will it take for that to actually affect that money supply? Or is that just going to keep kind of trending in the same direction? Yeah, you should you should see it. Uh, you know, so it's going to be a function of of deficits, right? And and the Fed, right, creating creating new currency. Um, so you should see we're seeing a slowdown already from what we saw right in in. In 2020, uh, I mean, but last year was still an extremely high year, right? In terms of we did almost three trillion in, in deficits, and the Fed was was still buying over a trillion in bonds. So, 
this year, if we wrap that up in March, you know, you're looking at a much slower rate of growth. Like, so, you know, that, so that's, that's a big change and we'll see how, how much of a change like that much of that will be dependent on if new spending bills get passed. Right. Um, the fed, you know, presumably they'll stop. I don't know if they're going to pull it, decrease it much. I think that'll be a fight, um, you know, to do that. Um, historically they've waited a little bit longer, uh, to do it after ending it, but you know, that, that could always happen. But so the rate of growth will slow. Um, and will that, well, that is the end of like an inflationary booms end with that pullback in the money supply. But are we going to see it enough of a pullback to end that boom? I don't, I don't know this year, but, um, but we'll see. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, intuitively. I don't think you're going to go right. Like, I don't think you're going to see 0% increase in the money supply. It doesn't seem likely that would be a huge shock. Right. And nobody wants to uh, see that. Right. Uh, so you're going to see something uh, and probably still be above average, but it's not going to be what we saw in, in 2020 and last year. It, it shouldn't be close to that. So yeah. So hugely important factor. Right. But hard to hard to predict ultimately what it's going to do it's just the rate of change we know the direction it's moving right and so we'll just keep an eye on it to see if it keeps moving in that direction going yeah, forward indeed all right well charlie thank you uh we've got a lot of questions if if you sent us a question we'll do our best to get back with you and, and we'll sync up with charlie i think we can probably answer a lot of these uh, maybe even answer some on, on twitter or uh, you know on your blog in a, in a future post but uh, yeah. certainly thank you to everybody for, for joining us this afternoon, Charlie, appreciate your time as always and your insights and, and look forward to doing this throughout the year. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And if we got a ton of questions and maybe we'll do one where it's, you know, half Q and a, or even all Q and a in the future, and we'll just roll with it. Right. <laughs> so happy, like happy to do that as well, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. See you next month. All right. Take care, everybody.